It starts with an idea. You're onto something. A truly meaningful solution for a problem facing our society. So you persevere. You push forward. Then one day, you're ready to make your pitch. This is your dream. Your chance to make an impact. Your positive change in the world. You talk to us. We're looking for solutions. We're inspired by your idea. We see the potential for impact. We act on it. We give advice and guidance, business and technology insights, expert mentorship, a sense of community, and a movement that's greater than all of us. We connect you with investors and partners that see the benefit beyond the spreadsheet. Suddenly, opportunities that were out of reach are now within your grasp. And because we see the world through your eyes, we're with you every step of the way, creating a real, sustainable business that connects profit with purpose, financial return with value for society. The result might just change the world. Brink, empowering game changers. Today, we live in an exciting data revolution where technology is rapidly changing the way we work and live. At OVH Cloud, we are at the forefront of this digital shift as a leading global cloud provider and the number one cloud solution in Europe serving customers worldwide. We are independent and vertically integrated with our data centers across our own fiber optic network bringing businesses everywhere a secure and efficient alternative to the other cloud hyperscalers with complete respect for data protection. And just how are we different from the tech giants? Here are four key advantages. Our history is grounded in developing innovative efficiencies with a clear vision for a more sustainable future. We own the full value chain and we manage the product life cycle. With our vibrant ecosystem of partners, customers, and our common goals, we offer a complete portfolio of cloud solutions in total compliance to industry and open source standards. And as an ecosystem, we are driven by purpose, united by common product values. Together, we are change makers. Building the future of technology for all, Hello. Good evening, everyone. We're about to start shortly. Take a seat. There are still very good seats available at the back over there or in the middle. So I hope you have enough uh, space. Huh? There's 1.5 meter apart from uh, each seat. So uh, social distancing respected uh, more than before with the drink uh, session. So uh, and it's good to see uh, real people and not to be on Zoom with a fake background and uh, everything, so it changed a bit, and uh, good thing with social distancing, the, uh, the room is always a full room, so uh, that's uh, nice as well. So thanks uh, everyone for coming uh, tonight, really happy uh, with Leo, uh, my name is Axel, Axel. Uh, very happy uh, to have you uh, tonight for the 18th edition of uh, Startup and Angel here in Sydney, and about uh, around uh, 50 or something like that uh, we've done around the world, so uh, I'm really happy to have uh, physical edition at least for uh, once in uh, 2020 in Sydney. We also uh, welcome uh, over 30 uh, virtual attendees. Say uh, hi everyone, hi from Sydney. They're just there, you don't so, see them. But, uh, yeah, very, um, let's say, uh, very sorry for some of you uh, who are still in lockdown. Uh, hi to our friends in Melbourne who are out of the lockdown. And Adelaide, hopefully not in between lockdowns. Um, Adelaide, we, uh, we've um, launched Startup and Angel, the, the community, with an amazing event thanks to uh, Stone and Shock uh, at the Lot 14. So 
uh, a big um, hello to uh, all our community over there. Yeah, we had three events this year uh, in, uh, in Australia, one in Melbourne before the lockdown, one uh, just after uh, in Adelaide, and uh, this one uh, today in Sydney. So, uh, yeah, once again, it's really good to see, uh, to see you and meet with uh, real people. So for, for some of you who remember how Startup and Angel works, uh, we actually uh, give you the opportunity to, um, to jump online, uh, scan this QR code. Uh, we've printed a few QR codes as well around the room. Uh, if you can't point on this, so and, and you join basically Zitings. Uh, Zitings, one of our actually technology partners since Startup and Angel existed, uh, no part of Canva. And basically, this uh, software will give you the availability to retrieve the slides that's going to be presented tonight. So you won't have to take pictures of the slides. You, you can just take a print screen and also to take part to some of the live surveys we're going to do uh, during the event. Okay, So you can just scan this QR code or uh, type the URL uh, zthings.com slash B2B rocks. Okay, so we've got a, a pretty uh, packed agenda tonight. Uh, we, we're still in the welcome words. Uh, we'll have, uh, we're then introducing Brink, one of our event partner, uh, together with Artesian Ventures tonight. Um, we'll have a few words from their CEO, Manav, uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll jump into the, the, the theme uh, with uh, Ali, just here from Artesian. Uh, basically doing a retrospective of, you know, 2020. Uh, this is this time of the year where, you know, we need to uh, look back and, and see what has happened this year. Um, and then we'll have uh, a panel moderated by Chuan from, uh, from Brink um, about, uh, you know, the forecast for next year with an amazing lineup of um, investors, mentors, advisors. Okay. And uh, toward the end, uh, we'll introduce our food and beverage partner, Delidor, who've prepared all those uh, amazing uh, quiche and pies and salads, Woo! Uh, and even brought some, uh, some wine for the networking drinks. Uh, so for virtual attendees, you know, uh, you can now jump on your favorite drinks. And if you've got the, the link, you know, tell us a bit more about, you know, your journey with, with Startup and Angels. All right, don't be, uh, don't be shy. You know, we've got some newbies, so that's, you know, always good. Um, and then, you know, some of you, uh, I mean, you've got normally a QR code at the back of A1 if you want. I like the uh, before COVID existed. <laughs> Didn't know it was uh, someone or... <laughs> Uh, there was a, a life before COVID. All right, so let's go to the to the next question. Maybe a bit more interesting, but it's good to see uh, so many new faces and so many new uh, new joiners. And hopefully, more interestingly, you know, uh, a good opportunity to know who is in the room, uh, who is following the event. Uh, in terms of audience, we always get a, a strong mix of you know entrepreneurs. Uh, you know, from early stage to, you know, a bit more uh, mature startups, uh, investors, and definitely we've got, you know, a few um, heavyweights today, um, as well as corporate executives. I've seen a number of innovation or transformation managers in the room. Um, you know, I'm curious to know, Matt, what did you vote it? A, B, C, D? <laughs> A bit of everything. All right, so then maybe the most interesting uh, one after. Yeah. So yeah, for our stats, we run this survey around the world. We've kept the same jokes. <laughs> uh, we actually added a new one because thanks to Tankstream Labs, where are, where are they, Brad? Uh, we actually got some uh, Prosecco spritz for the first time on the menu. Watch out for headaches. <laughs> All right, so it's good to, uh, to hear about wine. So you can taste the wine from Delidor. 
and Prosecco taking the third position. <laughs> so yes, as we said, so we've been running this event for the last uh, four years, uh, thousands attendees, 100 speakers, a bit around the world. So uh, Australia, of course, uh, even if uh, we still have that French uh, accent. Uh, no, we never run this event in France, uh, by the way, so that would be a first time, would be uh, good to speak in English there. Um, we did it uh, as far as uh, Rwanda, uh, Kenya, uh, Papua New Guinea with Port Moresby, uh, Asia, all over Asia, uh, Ulaanbaatar in Mongolia, uh, Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, uh, etc. So, um, and the goal uh, is to connect uh, startups, entrepreneurs, uh, business angel, uh, anyone can be a business angel uh, uh, in the room if you don't want only to invest in a property in Australia, but uh, also in uh, tech startups, etc. You can be a business angel as well. Um, and so we have an online uh, community that we've launched this year as well that has been really uh, useful during the uh, uh, online uh, events. Uh, same thing, to connect together, to share uh, tips, to share stories, etc. So uh, I'll invite you to uh, go on startupandangels.com and, uh, and uh, check it as well. Yeah, so basically, uh, you know, as Axel mentioned, and a big, big hat off to, uh, to the team, so to, uh, to Sophie sitting in, uh, in Mexico, who joined us uh, pretty much in, in June. Uh, we hope, Sophie, you'll be able to make it to Australia in 2021, definitely. We count on you. 22. Uh, uh, <laughs> until then, you know, enjoy your, your time, uh, you know, as a digital nomad. Um, a big, big hat off as well to Florencia. Where is Florencia? Running everywhere. Florencia, I mean, have a look to the, to the new version of the website. It's absolutely fantastic. You can retrieve... Uh, all the podcasts we've done, uh, the latest epi podcast episode is actually an interview of Chuan from, uh, from Brink. And basically, on the platform, uh, you can find a number of resources. You can actually talk and do your own uh, PR about, you know, uh, your fund, about all your activity. Um, you know, share news about your, uh, your startups, uh, call for co-founders, post uh, uh, jobs. Uh, it's all in self-service, and you know we uh, we moderate it. So join us. You can as well, you know, get uh, discounts for events and um, and get access here to all the resource for free. Uh, so maybe a bit about you know the the company behind uh, startup and angels, Australians. Uh, basically, what we all about kind of connecting. Uh, as well, you know, whether that's uh, helping you reach new markets, so we actually help a number of international startups uh, land in Australia, including our friend from Aircall at the back. So if you want to hear about how we can help uh, some of the uh, next unicorns to kind of grow in Australia, you can ask Sheldon, um, as well as, you know, talent acquisition solutions. So we really, really kind of uh, value uh, driven um, and so my team uh, you've met some of them Pooja uh, Pooja she's maybe still be at the reception uh, Nadia as well as Celine in Hong Kong uh, or Samuel uh, basically help you kind of source some of the top talents uh, we actually have uh, some innovative solutions coming up and uh, Next, early next week, we're gonna do an announcement with uh, with Tankstream Lab about a new um, or new internship solutions. And obviously, we we love you know connecting physically online with our event uh, series, startup and angel, and our conference B two B rocks. So that's a bit about us. Uh, if you want to know more, come and find me during the drinks. And without further ado, uh, we'll introduce our latest event partner uh, with uh, some uh, a quick video featuring Manav, who can't be with us today. Man, up to you. Hi. I uh, hope everybody's doing well. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to come in uh, remotely to say hello to all of you. Um, Tuan asked me just to say a few words about Brink and uh, tell you what we've been up to in 2020. Um, Brink is a global venture accelerator. Uh, we invest early uh, and support companies through their development life cycles. Uh, we invest through the structure of accelerator programs and work very closely with fantastic partners like Artesian um, so that we can help support 
uh, fantastic, game-changing founders from all over the world uh, build out their businesses and pursue their dreams. We're super excited to have launched recently in Australia um, with the support of Artesian to support clean energy companies um, in furthering their mission of building a much more sustainable uh, energy system. Uh, it's been a very trying year, I think, for us as well as our founders and, and a lot around the world. Uh, we spent a lot of time this year really focusing on uh, financial reengineering, looking at alternate sources of funding, working with our teams to explore ways to increase their runways, um, and, and build more of a resilient and strong foundation for their, their core um, while uh, keeping um, you know, the, the core uh, message um, and inspiration uh, at, at heart uh, in terms of why they actually got into the business and why they should continue to stay committed to the cause despite any of the challenges that they have faced, while also thinking about the ways to do it in a more sustainable way, which I think is you know, the absolute necessary uh, need of the hour. Um, we're excited to continue to support great companies in Australia and uh, you know, excited to partner with, with a lot uh, of the fantastic people that are in this room today. Um, and uh, wish this uh, event all the success. Um, and I uh, just wanted to say thank you for having us. Thank you for having us in Australia. And hopefully we'll get a chance to connect with all of you soon. Thank you very much. All right, so I won't present, uh, you know, Brink uh, Clean Energy and Clean Tech Accelerator Program. So if it's been launched, I'll just mention it's been launched this year uh, in Australia, and their program director here is here to, with us today. A big thanks to uh, Chuan uh, for, you know, making this event possible, uh, obviously to Artesian, uh, who is, you know, one, the, one of the first investors for, uh, for this program. Uh, you know, you'll have plenty of time to network with Tam. Tuan is very, very friendly. Uh, all, I'm, all I'm, I will mention is, you know, maybe similar to me is probably only have half of his brain still working because this weekend uh, where we were all hit by the heat wave, he was in Canberra beating the world record of paddling for 24 hours uh, with a team of crazy like him raising money f um, for people suffering from uh, chronic disease. So well done, Chuan, uh, our new world champion. Um, and thank you so much for, for being with us. Uh, so as I mentioned, like, you know, we've got a, an amazing lineup. Uh, thanks to all our, all our partners. Uh, you know, obviously, we mentioned Brink, uh, Artesian Ventures. So Artesian, that's actually the, the third event we're doing together this year, you know, after Melbourne, where actually Ali, you were there uh, for the, the event for uh, International Women Day. Uh, then we had uh, our launch event in Adelaide, uh, together with Stone and Shock, where same thing, Artesian uh, was our key event partner. Uh, we also want to thank a lot uh, OVH uh, Cloud uh, and Pledge 1%, our platinum uh, partner, who are supporting us uh, all year long. Um, and uh, now I'll introduce uh, Ali uh, from Artesian, who is going to be talking to us about what happened in uh, 2020. Welcome, Ali. Thanks, Leo. Um, 2020 retrospective, it's a, it's a tough one to uh, do this year. We've had about five years worth of events um, in one. So I'll try and summarize it as best as I can in 20 minutes or so. Um, just as a bit of an intro, my name's Ali Clunis ross I'm the portfolio manager for the Artesian Clean Energy Seed Fund. Um, we invest in um, early stage clean tech startups. We support Brink um, as well as a number of other accelerators and invest in clean energy startups from seed through to series B. So who is Artesian? Uh, we were founded in 2004 um, as an alternative investment manager. We have about $800 million under management, um, different, differently to some of the other VCs. Uh, we also have a, a debt fund. Um, these are about equally weighted. Um, and then we have an early stage, we're an early stage VC fund um, out of Australia and we also have a fund in China where we also partner with Brink. 
Um, Artesian focuses on a number of um, different thematics. So we have an agnostic fund which invests in um, typical SaaS products, any sort of agnostic technology. Um, we have an agri-food uh, fund where we're focused on food security, um, uh, precision agriculture and sustainability. The Clean Tech Fund, which I mentioned, is looking at clean energy, mobility, um, waste, carbon, um, carbon storage and, and climate change change. Um, and then medical and health, we're focused on medical devices. Uh, and then we've just recently launched um, BOAB, which is an artificial um, intelligence accelerator scale-up program um, where we partner with LaunchVic in Melbourne. Um, our deal flow mainly comes from um, our large network. So we have um, a number of accelerators, incubators that we partner with, as well as corporates, um, industry bodies. We have a huge amount of founder alumni who obviously support, our, um, support us in finding the next best founder, um, as well as other co-investment partners. So I just wanted to start this off by talking about um, the global venture dollar volume through um, through to Q3. So um, as Crunchbase has put out, there was a clear decline in Q1 um, as COVID started to hit. We saw that start to ease off, but we saw a real focus in later stage and technology growth deals. Um, this was as the VC... Um, industry started to become a little bit more risk averse and look at companies which had um, stronger data, stronger growth um, and had the largest chance of success. The other thing that we saw um, really wipe off was um, the angel and seed stage. Angel investors were hit hard um, as the private, uh, as the public markets were shaken at the start of the year. Um, they were, became quite risk averse and that, that investment started to reduce. Um, so we can see that there was quite a large number of um, later stage deals um, through Q uh, um, during 2020. Um, when we look at Artesian's investment, um, we started the year pretty strong, and we um, we had some larger deals in Q2 um, as following the sort of market. We we remained dynamic and continued our investment throughout the whole um, period of COVID. Um, and now we're starting to see that increase. Um, some of the, the deals that we saw this year were 5B. We participated in their Series A investment um, alongside Fortune 500 energy company AES. Um, that's a modular rapid deployment um, a company which um, deploys solar panels. Uh, we also invested in Turtle Tree Labs out of our China fund. They raised 3.2 million USD. Um, this is a cell-based milk company, which is actually focused initially on human milk and then moving to cow's milk, um, as formula is a big issue in China. Um, then Swarm Farm, we participated and we co-led their um, Series A investment. They raised $4.5 million. That's an autonomous agricultural robot company. Um, and Evergen, we also led their Series A round of um, $7 million. Um, they manage optimised battery fleets um, to enable virtual plough plants. So uh, to summarise, I tried to make, um, use just five big trends of 2020. Um, so one, we looked at technology stocks, they're, they're outperforming. Um, this obviously trickled down into the private markets. Um, secondly, we saw an impact increase in impact investing and imp investing for purpose. And there are a number of funds that um, started to pop up this year in that space. Uh, we saw a larger division between East and West as there was an increased um, political tension between China and the West. And that's obviously had major impacts on the tech sector. Um, there's been a push towards clean tech and agri-food as major global themes as we, um, as countries, governments, corporates look towards sustainability, the ne need for food security um, and um, energy security. And finally, I'll finish off with uh, what, what trends we expect to see in 2021. So starting off um, with technology stocks, so they're um, 
software is eating the world. So if we look at 2009, um, the number of companies, the top 10 companies by market cap, um, there was a real focus on um, energy companies. Um, and then we can see 2020, it's dominated by technology companies. Um, I think everyone in the room will know that the new one for this year on that list is Tesla. Um, they've done particularly well and also driven some themes um, and some of the themes that we've seen in clean tech this year. Um, so when looking at Australia, um, we can see that the best and worst of um, performing stocks, and just to note, this is from August, we've seen some dynamic changes since, um, since we've seen some news about the vaccine. But the point here is that um, technology has the ability to um, defend against crises. It's scalable. Um, we've, at the start of the year, after pay was looking at... Um, how consumer discretionary would be impacted by COVID. And then we can see they've had a huge performance this year. Um, and then again, the ASX, um, the average share price return, we saw um, a really strong increase in information technology um, with energy being the loser in this case. Again, another um, theme that we're seeing and a push towards clean technology. Um, I think the other things to note that um, we saw uh, the forced adoption of technology. Um, this allows startups to this has allowed st startups to grow e exponentially. Um, we've seen a number of large listings in the US. Um, there was Snowflake, Palantir, um, Airbnb was struggling at the beginning of the year. Now they're raising. Um, they're listing at thirty billion dollars. Um, we also saw an increase in SPACs, which are special purpose acquisition corporations. They're essentially um, blank check corporations where um, the management firm raise money um, on the hope that they will um, acquire a company. So there were 82 IPOs that were completed um, through SPACs this year. And to give you a bit of context, um, there's only been sort of just over 200 SPACs since two, um, 2015. Uh, so it's 2015. Um, so we've seen a real increase in um, that as if there's a real ease for um, a, an ease and ability to IPO through this vehicle. When looking at impact investing, um, we can see that Australia's investment market is up 17% from 2018. Um, there is definitely a push towards adherence to um, the UN principles of responsible investment. Um, there are a number of uh, VC-style investment groups that we're seeing in Australia, Artesian, Impact Investment Group, Scale, um, that are coming through. Uh, we have offices globally and um, when looking at um, our impact and the impact space and how we um, participate in particularly the US, we've seen that there's um, there's definitely they're very mo they're very much more mature in their thinking about impact investing, but we're starting to see that trickle down into Australia um, as well. Large division between east and west. So um, we've seen that there's become there's a bigger divide between the US and China this year, um, impacted by a number of factors um, as well as Trump, the Trump administration, um, regulation, and that sort of increasing political push has reduced technology's abil um, technology companies' ability to access both markets. So we're seeing that there's a real trend towards um, choosing the West or choosing China. Both are obviously massive markets, and companies can be very successful choosing one, but there it is becoming more and more difficult um, to to access both markets. Um, there's also we've also seen the sort of need for Australia um, to uh, have energy security, food security, and manufacturing security as China started to push back on Australia's um, export market. So. As I've mentioned, as a thematic through, um, there's been this increased um, interest in agri-food and clean tech as major global themes. So we've seen there's been a real push from government. So this year there was the National Drought Fund, you know, that was pushed through by the um, the fire, the bushfires that we had at the start of the year. Um, there's the renewable energy plan that the New South Wales government announced just last week. Um, the Victorian budget. Um, and South Australia and then federal government um, incentives as well. Um, typically we see when those uh, 
funds are announced, there's a real innovation push in those sectors as well. Um, Agri-food and clean tech are often skewed a little bit by government grants. Um, these companies really need those government grants because they can be quite capital intensive. So they need those sorts of grants to get off the ground. So these sorts of indicators um, really breed innovation in those areas. Um, and then we've seen a massive push from corporates. Um, the clean tech fund is... Um, almost four years old and the, the difference that we've seen from the start from four years ago to now in terms of corporates has been astronomical. Um, there's a number of companies that have committed to being carbon neutral. Um, there's a number of companies that are committing capital to innovation, to um, disrupting their own um, business and product lines to ensure that they're on top of the curve. And the other thing that I guess in terms of clean tech as a major theme, we've seen a real... Um, a cost decrease. So uh, since in the last 10 years, there's been an 89% decrease in the cost of solar um, electricity generated by solar. Um, so that decrease and that um, ability to get to that unit economics has allowed for innovation to to um, to boil on top of that. So we've really started to see that increase, particularly in Australia. So looking at emerging tech trends for 21, I've specifically left off the um, the video conferencing. I think we all agree we've seen that boom. Um, but looking at um, clean tech and ag tech, so this year Artesian did, uh, sorry, to date Artesian has done um, 60 deals in clean tech and, and another just over 60 in ag tech, um, deploying around 13 million in clean tech and just under 10 mil in agri-food. Um, AI and ML, so there's a real push and, and I know that there's a massive buzzword here, but um, there's a real push for optimization. Optimization in a number of sectors. Um, we're seeing in Australia a real trend towards healthcare, diagnostics. Um, AI and machine learning is going to be the back-end technology to allow um, the efficiency and optimization of technologies across a range of sectors. Cloud tech, we've gone virtual. Um, Corporations are re-jigging um, their, their current offices, working out what it's going to look like for 2021. There's been a real need for both private and public cloud servers. And we're seeing a range of innovations in that space. Um, fintech, so digital payments. Um, I think in Australia, we're pretty lucky that we can have events like these, but you know, around the world, We've, we're still trying not to touch each other, trying not to touch money, not to use money. There's been a massive adoption of digital payments um, and improving um, the the global um, the, the global treasury. Health tech, uh, I guess, COVID has really pushed the need towards telehealth. Um, we're seeing a number of end-to-end -end platforms in Australia that go from diagnosis all the way through to delivery of your prescriptions. Um, I don't know if anyone went to the doctor during COVID, but it wasn't a pleasant experience. Um, health tech, it's cheaper for uh, for the patients. Um, the doctors can actually um, pump out more um uh, more diagnosis. It's it's a better and more efficient way to um, move health tech into the future. Um, information security. This one sort of al al aligns with the cloud tech um, as we start to move towards virtual um, uh, virtual offices, um, and we're still working from home. There's a number of issues with information security and how corporates can ensure that information is safe. And finally, mobility, um, we're seeing a number of people not wanting to um, go on public transport. Uh, there's a lot of logistics, there's a lot of logistics platforms that are coming up in Europe to ensure that there's not a huge number of people on public transport. We're seeing a rise in um, smart cities and how um, how we can sustainably get, a, um, get across the, um, get from our home to our work, uh, particularly through things like electric, um, electric vehicles um, and electric bikes. And Q&A. <laughs> you did an amazing job covering one, one full year here. <laughs> Thank you. 
Yeah, I think in term in in terms of the terms of deals, um, we saw a, a bit of a shift. Um, the LPs haven't had a pushback. The fund manager is determining the the um, terms of the deal. There were mechanisms um, that we were seeing put in place to ensure um, risk mitigation, um, but particularly in you know, the end of Q1, the start of Q2, um, when things were a little bit more uncertain, um, particularly around protection of downside um, risk. So that's one thing that we were seeing. Um, I guess we've also seen uh, the US investors really shut off to Australia um, sort of Q2, um, start of Q3, because they had to focus on their own portfolios. They wanted to focus on um, companies that were close to them. So we saw that sort of um, push off and now they're coming back and some of their terms are quite aggressive. Um, but I, I think that it's sort of settled down now and we're seeing now people understand the risk. Um, it's not as crazy as it was in sort of March and April. Um, and, and we're seeing sort of pre-COVID terms. I haven't seen any in Australia to date. Um, I think it's um, it, it's an interesting way to IPO. I think that typically the way that we see trends flow, we see it succeed in the US and then we'll see something happen in Australia. In the US, it's there's been a lot of funding this year. Um, I think I had a number on how many have actually acquired companies and it's pretty low. It's um, So I, I'm not sure if, and, and we also don't have yet, we are building it, but we don't have the sort of tech and the fund management um, profiles of those people who are in the US who have the ability to raise hundreds of millions of dollars on a, an empty com an empty company yeah all right thank you so much okay. ali um, and uh, yeah it would definitely be interesting we uh, with ali we had a an online uh, panel discussion back in uh, may i think as part of uh, one of our first uh, online events so that would be interesting to uh, kind of go back uh, to this podcast and see what has changed between May and today. So let me try to put the zitting back online. And yeah, three finger. I'm not a Mac person. But I, no, you, you did well. That was. And um, and yeah, we d you will have uh, more time for Q and A Q &A with the with the panel. Uh, and that's going to be moderated by uh, Chuan. So we're going to get all the panelists coming on stage uh, and we'll try to line them up in this order, okay? So Chuan is going to be sitting over there. Then we'll have Luke from Artesian, Melissa from Lighter Capital, and we're going to even put you here, so not in the lights, okay? Matt and Amanda. All right. Thank you, Leo. Good evening. I'm Tuan Lam from Brink. Our topic tonight is startup funding perspective for 2021. And Alexandra did a fantastic job of setting the scene. So 2020 has been a crazy year across the globe with a lot of unexpected changes everywhere in all industries, in, all, in our life. And there are still potentially many more to come with COVID still continuing to unfold. So our health systems, economies, businesses, education systems, supply chains, the way we work, the way we buy, and of course, financial market and venture markets have been deeply impacted and everything has to adapt overnight. There is a serious debate about whether VC venture investment will continue to recover and grow on its current trend, even thrive even more, or maybe crash next year. And what does this mean in Australia for entrepreneurs, founders, investors, and corporates? That's what we want to know. So that's our topic tonight. So we have the privilege to have four terrific panelists to talk with us about it. 
And our panel conversation will be followed by an interactive Q&A session at the end. So let's start with the introduction from our panel. So uh, my dear panelists, uh, in two minutes, could you please introduce yourself and share the one thing that will ever change forever since this year? So Amanda? <laughs> Sorry. Wait, it takes a second. Anna? Ah, yeah, because I can hear myself. Hi, I'm Amanda, I'm Amanda Price, from, I'm the head of High Growth Ventures, so we're a um, division at KPMG that's dedicated to working with startup. Oh. <laughs> um, so our goal is to help our founders and their teams and the business achieve sustained high performance, and we do that in a couple of ways. We um, have a program called Upside, which is for founders that, it's designed to help founders optimise their performance. Um, that's led by Craig Davis, which we just relaunched last week. Um, and we actually also, with the, on the business side, we connect the businesses into the expertise within KPMG and we have an offering that supports founders from a seed to IPO. Um, the one thing that's changed, I don't know if it's like the one thing, because I think there's like so many little things that have changed, but I think when I, th when I got that question, I was like, I think the thing that I saw is the, that adaptability has become a key factor in all of this. I think that we, I've seen founders and also us as a business, we had to, to pivot and change and give back and lose half our team. Jahan's in the team, he's still here. Um, <laughs> out, lose half the team and, and really actually just completely change our business model and, I've, and we just had to really adapt really quickly and I think the founders that we've seen that have survived and actually thrive is all about adaptability and I think we're now rehiring and one of the key things I'm looking for is proof of adaptability. So I think that's just become where it was always a real, right? resilience is still really important. I just think adaptability is going to be really key going forward. G'day everyone, I'm Matt Brown. Uh, I'm a founder turned investor. So I built a company called Dunsafe and exited at Series B. Uh, I built another company that went through Y Combinator which was called Wispley, uh, still involved there at Wispley. Uh, and most recently launched another technology company through the Antler program which is called Upflowy. Um, on top of that, I uh, have been an angel investor active since about mid-18. Uh, we've backed a little over 25 companies now in Australia, uh, coming up to nearly 30 actually. Um, and uh, decided to switch that into an early stage VC fund. So we are Black Nova Venture Capital. Uh, we're currently ra um, raising an ESV CLP. Uh, we are deploying out of our warehouse fund and we've written a bunch of checks through the COVID period. Uh, what's changed in the last 12 months? Well, 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 a hell of a lot. You know, I think for me, I, I had a, a newborn baby, bought and sold a house and moved during the period and tried to, tried to build a startup and build a fund through COVID. So I, I can't put my finger on any one particular thing other than the fact that uh, I found a way to be even busier because I didn't have to leave my doorstep and so I was able to do all of my investing via Zoom, which was, which was kind of fun. Hi, I'm Melissa Widner. I am the CEO of Lighter Capital. Lighter Capital is a Seattle-based um, company that does non-dilutive, that provides non-dilutive growth capital to startups. We've been around about 10 years. Um, I'm new to Lighter. I'm new in this role at Lighter. I used to run NAB Ventures and Lighter was an investee of NAB. Um, and so I've been involved with the company for a couple of years. Um, I've been in venture capital for a long time in the US and in Australia. Prior to that, I ran a software company. I was the founder and um, CEO of a software company uh, based in Palo Alto that um, had a very successful exit. Came to Australia about 11 years ago and have been involved in um, this great ecosystem which has grown so much in the last 11 years. Um, in terms of change, I don't think I'd be sitting up here talking to you as the CEO of Lighter Capital if not for COVID. Because um, I, you know, I ran companies before, but I've been in venture for so long and probably six months ago, I never would have thought I would jump back into an operating role. But there was this opportunity at Lighter and I really loved the company and loved what they were doing. But, but I never would have thought I could jump into a company in Seattle and run a company in Seattle from Sydney for a while. And I, I, am, I, have, I am from Seattle, I have a house there and spend some time of the year there. But, um, but you know, I, nobody has seen each other since the beginning of March at our company in Seattle. They have not seen each other in person. We just got out of our $50,000 a month lease, yes, but nobody has been in the office for um, a long time. So in terms of what's changed, 
Um, we're hiring people now, and they never would have thought of hiring outside of Seattle. And now we're looking everywhere. We're looking in all over the US, all over Australia. So, so that's really changed, and I think it's going to have a big effect on um, you know, these, these tech companies in Ohio that really had protected workforces because nobody was poaching them. They've now not got Google and Amazon and Microsoft poaching their employees, so it's really interesting. Um, Luke Faye from Artesian. Um, I run the, uh, the venture capital business. Um, Ali's already done a fantastic job of explaining really what we do um, and some of the things that we're, we're thinking at the moment. Um, very briefly, um, to I guess recap a little bit of what Ali said, you know, we're, we're an early stage specialist. We focus on investing in seed through to Series B. We, uh, we manage around well, just under 500 investment uh, companies or investments in portfolio companies. Which is, uh, which is quite a task. Um, and I've got some of the, the best portfolio managers in the country, I think, and Ellie's, Ellie's one of those, as you've, as you've seen uh, this evening. Um, I, I think in terms of some of the things that we, you know, we, we learned um, through, through COVID, um, the two things that stuck out for me were the benefit of our geographical reach, like having the you know, people located across Australia and across um, you know, Asia Pac and, and in the US and Europe was a, was a really big benefit for us so that we could, we could get a handle very quickly on what was going on um, and we could help our portfolio companies in, in region adjust it to what was going on pretty quickly and, and find them, you know, really good opportunities. Um, and also on top of that, I think, is, you know, the benefit of our, um, yeah, I, I guess, our investment diversification strategy across 16 funds. Um, so it allowed us to, to, you know, the diversification allowed us to sort of really develop strong views across different verticals, horizontals, ge you know, geographies and stages, so that we felt that we were, you know, really on top of what was going on through COVID um, and feel in a really good place, you know, moving into 2021 around where we're going and, and how we want to invest. Thank you very much. So to summarize, uh, power of our geographic reach and diversification, um, virtual teams and being a, rem a remote CEO, uh, adaptability and uh, investment from the couch. <laughs> Are the takeaways? <laughs> so let's start with the questions. So first question is, how early stage and late stage venture investments are evolving, in your opinion, in this? Uh, COVID situation continuing to unfold uh, in 2021. Yeah, look, I, I think one of the interesting things we've seen through through 2020 into 2021, you know, is one back uh, a couple of years ago when I was raising funds for you know my startups, it was very much a, a long-term relationship game, and Zoom has actually democratized investing in many ways. So for for a number of companies, you know, I, I met founders that I probably wouldn't have met at events normally. I met founders that I probably wouldn't have been introduced to otherwise. But because my calendar was open, because I was sitting in my office chair, I think I was just open to to many more meetings through the period. And so I think you know an openness to to take deals from outside your network and to meet people from outside your network has really grown through 2020. And I think that's something that's gonna continue through 2021. Um, you know, I think the, the propensity in Australia as well, if you look, a, a lot of the VCs have kind of moved up market. You know, there's been a lot of VCs that have taken large super fund investments and things like that. And so typically there was kind of a, a dry spell for a period in early stage. But one of the things I really enjoyed seeing through through the period recently also was, um, you know, the, just the, the number of ESV CLP applications that came through uh, during the COVID period. So I think a number of people like me, you know, second, third time founders exited have now gone, you know what, I want to go and reinvest back into the ecosystem. So I think you can see a number of new players coming out in 2021 who are here to fill the gap left by some of the bigger VCs that have moved up market. Someone else? Like <laughs> Luke? Um, I mean, look, from a trend perspective, I, I, yeah, I, I agree. I think we, we did start to see people go a little bit later, but I think you know, we, we sort of felt that it's important to build your own deal flow and, you know, going broadly early is a great way to, to build your funnel um, and de-risk your funnel moving forward. Um, so, we, you know, we, we tried to focus on that and we tried to look at ways to, to kind of de-risk those, those early stage investments and we used a variety of, of strategies, but 
Um, you know, I think we, we use tranching a lot more and milestone sort of driven, um, you know, gates to unlock lock capital, which, which you know, so you kind of try to give early stage founders the opportunity at a, at a bigger check, but, but you had to sort of, you gated it and you had to sort of achieve certain milestones to get there. I think the benefit of that was it, it kind of de-risked it for both of us, so you had a very clear idea of what you had to achieve and, and where you needed to go. Um, but it also gave them some certainty around funding if, if they got to, you know, if they were able to achieve what they need to achieve. So, so that was sort of something that we saw a lot more of. Um, I mean, in the later stage space, I mean, Ali, Ali sort of, you know, spoke a, a little bit about it. Um, we've probably been a, a lot busier, um, you know, around the Series A and B space, which is more probably a dynamic around our portfolio, given we've been investing early stage for sort of, you know, seven years. So we're seeing a lot of activity of those earlier stage companies now ready for that sort of Series A and B funding and looking to scale globally, which is which is particularly exciting. And you know, Ali mentioned a, a few of those. Um, and I think also that the the other thing which I think is 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 emerging, you know, as you see these you know vertical trends and secular trends, they're, they're very different in terms of how how you approach them. So having the specialisation, you know, when, when you're looking at you know clean tech and clean energy, how to how to how to do DD, how to how to set terms, how to how to you know, really come up with an investment thesis can be very different from a you know enterprise SaaS business. So you know, having that bench strength, you know, in our team anyway, to look at that really vast array of opportunity and, and, and understand how to work with the founder and the different business models and the different verticals and the different horizontals to come up with a funding strategy that, that works, you know, for the company but also you know drives performance for the fund and also drives strategic you know um, performance for our um, LPs. Thank you, Matt and Luke. So, uh, what type of investors? So we, uh, you mentioned the, you know, uh, the rise of uh, more um, application for uh, ESVC LPs and also bigger uh, VCs going a bit more to level toward late stage. But what type of investors will be potentially more active next year? And basically, who has money to deploy <laughs> into the Australian startups next year? would say debt investors since that's what I'm doing now but um, but it, it's it's been great we have we've done a, uh, in the last decade we've done close to um, 800 loans and mostly in the US or almost all in the US and it's it's really interesting um, this this we were lighter was the uh, pioneer in the SaaS based lending our most of our companies are technology companies with SaaS revenue and um, now there's a lot of other players in the US doing this, but it's, it's really interesting looking at our portfolio now. So we have about 200 companies in our portfolio today, and they have been able to use non-dilutive funding to get to just great places. And I think that you're, we're going to see that happen more and more. We just, one of our companies just raised $30 million from Sequoia, and they had raised just before that from Andreessen Horowitz, and before that they had done two debt financings from us with non-dilutive, so they got to that point. Another one of our companies was acquired by Salesforce for $300 million, and they had never raised any venture capital. So I think one of the thing that we're going to see, and, and I've been in venture capital for 20 years, and we work closely with venture capitalists, we love venture capitalists, but we're going to just see a a lot more variety of, of funding. And um, I think it, I think you made a great point on COVID really democratizing funding. Um, you know, Sand Hill, early stage Sand Hill Road investors would say they're not going to invest in a company where, you know, they can't get there in their Tesla within 20 or 30 minutes. And, and that's all changed now. So I think we're going to see um, it be, uh, become a lot easier for remote companies to raise money and for people to invest anywhere in the world. I, I, one of the things I love is the optionality of capital that's starting to exist in Australia. So the fact that you now have, you know, Artesian and Lighter with debt facilities, you've got uh, One Ventures and Adventure Capital and a couple of others also with debt facilities. You've got a really uh, vibrant, you know, and, and for disclosure, I'm also a venture partner at Antler. And so you've got a really vibrant generator and accelerator community that's really growing here in Australia. And so access to idea capital and access to early founder capital uh, pre-taking any institution institutional capital is now available and so I think you know there are there is a huge number of places for founders to access capital in 2021 and that goes now thankfully you know from spectrum of I have an idea and it's on a napkin you know and I want to go and you know I'm really bright and I'm really hungry and I've just been working at Atlassian or Safety Culture or Canva and I want to start my own business go to go and work with Antler right through to you know if I want to raise a series B and you know and, and the like we've got Artesian and I want to take some debt because I don't want to dilute too heavily I've got debt ventures so I just think there's a 
huge variety of capital available and I think founders uh, need to equip themselves with the education on which type of capital is best at which stage. I think this might be, I'd be interested in everyone else's thoughts on this, but I think for us, Interestingly, we're seeing from our high net worth family office practice, we're seeing a lot more interest in them investing in. So we're sort of under pressure <laughs> to, to show what we're working on. And so, I mean, I know there's not enough funding in that space, but but certainly for us, we're seeing a really big um, interest in it. And there's also, you know, you look at Rachel Newman and Carly Fraser, you've got, sec, you know, working angel theory, you've got GLX, you've got, you know, see, so we've got now sort of those those sort of funds and I don't know, I, I think there's just a lot happening at that space as well. There's, it's sort of hard to make money anywhere else at the moment, so hopefully the people start to put that into startups. Thank you. So what sectors of the startup ecosystem, so it, with, uh, Ali get shared you know, some trends around you know, t cloud tech, clean tech, mech tech, agri tech, but where are you uh, looking to uh, invest in next year? Well, I'll say that um, I've gone through the tech rec and the GFC in venture capital. And when COVID hit, I thought it was going to be the same thing or something similar. And we haven't seen that at all. And at Lighter, we stopped lending. We pretty much stopped lending like everyone else did when COVID hit because we didn't know what would happen. We'd ha we have this book that has performed amazingly over the last eight years but it's always been in an up market. So when COVID hit, we, we didn't know what would happen. We didn't know if our whole book would blow up and everybody would go out of business. But um, what's what's been great to see is the these tech companies with SaaS, with recurring revenue, have done so well. And I, I really, I don't want to say this without knocking on wood, but we haven't had a single one of our companies go out of business, which is just amazing, because we, we lend to early stage companies. Um, and part of that could be because they have PPP loans, which is the um, US government sort of equivalent of our, um, what it would is our um, work, you know, job keeper here. Uh, so we don't know how much that's holding, propping it up. But but we have, you know, a few of our companies are, we're really hit hard. We have one that's an events management company. So, you know, what are, what are you going to do? Their revenue is down 90%. But they're surviving because they still have some recurring revenue. They were able to adjust their costs. And because of the nature of our loan product, our, we have a RBF, which is revenue-based financing. So they're, they're paying off a percentage of their revenue. So they don't have this big loan burden if their revenues drop. Um, so it's a really great product for this market. Uh, we have another company that's a ticketing company, again, hit really hard, but they are surviving. They were able to cut their costs, and we know when things open up, they'll do really well. So so I just I just thought this was going to be like the GFC or the tech rec, and, and it hasn't been. It's, it's been pretty um, amazing, and I don't know if this goes to Amanda's point where, you know, part of it is where are people going to put their money? There's no yield. Um, in, in, in safe investments right now. So that's part of what's driving. Yeah, it's actually, this is sort of a bit on the side, but <laughs> I'll just throw it in anyway. But we, the, we have this um, report, we do Venture Pulse, so it's a global report we do it every year, we've done it for years, and it, it just sort of tracks trends. And we tracked, I was looking at the last six months of, the first six months, of, so January to June last year to this year, so at that point, there was 627 million invested in, in Australian startups, and this year there was 945 million. So it's a, I'll get this wrong, but it's 318 million. <laughs> uh, there's a pretty significant increase in funding, right? So we're seeing, I think, like, that's huge. And then you look at the funds and you go, Blackbirds, Rays, Airtree, Square Peg, Today, One Venture. There's a heap of money. Like, there seems to be lots of money out there. And then we've got, as I said, you know, you've got family officers who are desperate to get into the space. and I want to, a, a VC I was talking to last week said, I won't mention him just in case this is controversial, but it's like he said it's embarrassingly easy to raise a pre-series A, you know, and I, I'd be interested in your thoughts because you're more in that space because we don't invest, so we're sort of observers. But I don't know, it seems, it seems to be a huge amount of activity. And like you, we were like, I'm not getting off, I'm staying. <laughs> so, no, that we're seeing a, um, we just thought, I thought it was like, I went through the GFC in a startup in the US and I'm like, this is all, we're all going to go under. It's going to be terrible, and the opposites happened. And it's we've seen our companies we're working with are going crazy. So it's, it's an interesting time. Yeah, I think you know it's it's really interesting. So so on Black Never, we're, we're um, thematically focused on 
B two B, predominantly SaaS and a little bit of enterprise tech. Um, in terms of in terms of what you know, I, I guess what we're looking at, um, you know, one of the things in the Artesian slides previously, you know, AI ML it is a buzzword, but if you're using it to to really think about the future of work, it's a place that we're we're very interested in. Um, we are also uh, big fans of the no code movement, and so for us, um, you know, no code has gone through this evolution where it used to be really generalist and wide and not really good at doing much other than create an MVP. But what's really nice now is there's a real no-code movement that is, is point solution and, and focused on a specific space uh, and going really deep with great constraints. And so those sorts of no-code solutions are something we've backed a number of. And you know, also from an, an early stage point of view, I can see a number of founders that we've backed in this room as well. So um, you know, we want to continue to back a bunch. You know, we're looking to back hopefully another 30 founding teams next year. Um, yeah, look, I think the only thing I'd add, um, pick, picking up on something that Amanda said, is that I, I, I do think there is a lot of capital around, there are a lot of alternatives, but, but I think that the bar is still a little bit higher than it was previously. Um, you know, I, I think you know, you're looking for more out of startups when you're making an investment. Like, it, it's not just your business model and your, you know, your total addressable market and the, you know, the bigger picture opportunity. You're, you're really looking for, for teams that have, have really good awareness about where, where they're at, what the economy is doing, how their product fits in the, you know, in the global scheme of things and, and how, how it's going to perform in a, you know, in a, in a, in COVID or post COVID world and really thinking very clearly about, about and being able to talk about it in a very calm and, and clear way. And for us, it's been a really good, I guess, filter or, or selection process as we, you know, we have a big portfolio. So you, you know, the, the, the days of, you know, founders coming in saying, "If you if you don't fund me, I'm out of business. Don't don't cut it anymore." You've got to you you've really got to you know got to got to separate yourself from the crowd to, to get that funding. Yeah, I think we're seeing definitely more due diligence, financial due diligence done on companies. So we're working on a lot of that, and now we haven't seen a lot of tech due diligence done, and we're certainly that that, and also um, a lot more around revenue, like where's the revenue customer really customer focused all that. So yeah, I think it's definitely seems. I mean, there's a lot, as you said, I agree, there seems to be a lot of money there, but I definitely think there's, the investors are looking more closely at the at the financials and sort of, you know, the tech DD, all that sort of stuff. So, yeah, more, more sort of diligence. Yeah, look, we, I think it's a good point. I mean, we, we, um, I mean, we do a lot of financial DD, but I, I, I tend to spend most of my time on the tech DD. Um, you know, you just, want to, you just want to look at the model and make sure it makes sense with the, you know, the, the, the business model and the, and the you know, the, the the plans of the business moving forward, but but until you really get in there, invest and and, and learn with the, the founder and the company, it's it's especially at the very early stage, you can waste a lot of time. I think looking at financials. So we, you know, it's really trying to get into the tech and understand the IP and the defensibility and and, and where it can go. And um, yeah. All right. Well, you've already answered the last question, which was, you know, <laughs> what will you will look at for <laughs> in the startup in twenty twenty one, but. Um, yeah, Matt. I might add the other thing that's you know really important to mention is you know as early stage investors the, the big thing I'm always looking for is founder first and so you know tech due diligence really important to understand that the tech that you're thinking about building is going to hit a real need and that is going to be you know a level of defensibility but if you can find a founder with that adaptability that was kind of mentioned at the start that can you know really sort of just shuffle up you know the, the best founders can come in with one product and you know six months later be doing something completely different that's even more backable and so for me personally I'm looking for founders with super adaptability with you know uh, a real drive and hunger to solve the underlying problem you know no matter what the technology solution is going to be that's put on top. So I'll grab the microphone again. I am um, <laughs> just go for another 10 minutes today. <laughs> no, no I, was, I think on the other side of that um, what we're also seeing we're certainly like three years ago we launched these programs there's some people here that did them on founder like high, sort of high performance, helping founders achieve what we call sustained high performance, so a real focus on mental and physical well-being, right? And three years ago when we launched it, everyone was like, it was sort of like, oh, nice to have, but it wasn't that important. And now there's, from the VC, well, the VCs are always sort of focused on, there's a real increase in focus on mental and physical well-being of founders. And so I, don't, I just don't want to say that it's just around the finance and the tech due diligence, because it's not, I, I agree that it's not only, it's always been around the founding team, but now there's a real look at 
you know, are, are they mentally and physically well? Are they going to be the people that can be, you know, sustain the level of pressure that's required? And I think we're seeing much more of a focus on, on that as well. So I think it's, it's all of it. But, but certainly that's, I think all of us, you know, you're hearing much more around that sort of, men, especially mental well-being for founders, which is fantastic. Yeah, look, I, I'd agree. And I think it's almost become a, you know, a key, a key part of governance for boards now too, like, you know, Every board meeting you have with with your companies, you're checking in on on the well-being of the founders, but the broader team as well to see how they're they're dealing with this. And I, I hope that it extends. No, I agree, and I hope that continues to extend because you you, know, you you do see you know significant stress and strain. I mean, it's not just COVID. I mean, you can get hundreds of exogenous things that get thrown at startups at any given time that'd be on their control. So, you know, having that that structure and that governance in place to deal with it, I think, is is incredibly important. Thank you. So now let's open the stage for the Q&A session. Um, anyone with a question in the room? Uh, could, could you please state yeah, your name? See, and, uh, uh, hi, my name's Gordon Renouf, one of the founders of Good On You. Um, just picking up on your point there about um, well-being um, and governance, when do you think a startup should get a board and how, what should they look for? What's the key attribute of that first director? Look, that's, look it's a good question. I mean, I think, um, uh, I mean, usually when you, when you, I think around the time you're taking your first institutional money, um, you know, I, I think, it, look, and it depends what your journey is. You know, typically I think you can do particularly well with, with, with angels that, that can, can step on the board. Um, but, but I think typically you're looking to really get that governance right when you're taking on institutional investment. And um, you know, for example, us, we, 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 don't, we don't enforce um, you know, board seats, for example. We, we'd rather often be a trusted advisor and, and observer and, and um, we'll insert ourselves if, if we need to. But, but I think you, you really want to have people on the board that are going to you know, help you and, and help with your journey and really, really add strategic value. Um, so it's more than just the investing, I think. But, but I think at that, that institutional stage, when you're taking that first institutional money, I think is, it's important where you want to really start to, you know, become, you know, not not corporate, but but you know, more more institutional like. A lot of the companies that Lighter Capital has funded have funded are um, ones where the entrepreneur does not want a board. They don't want anybody telling them what to, what to do. That's why they want non-dilutive capital, you know. Um, and it, so it's really interesting. And, and that's not all of them, but but it's a big chunk of them. And in fact, one of our um, you know one of our selling points is no board seats. You know, we don't. There's no covenants, no board seats. So it's really interesting um, to see these companies just succeed. You know, some of them to you know succeed to you know really uh, large revenue dollars without having a board in place. But um, so I, I don't know how to answer your question. As a venture capitalist, I would have said, get one early, get a board early and get them on board. But, but now seeing so many companies who, who have gone, um, you know, who, who have really gotten quite far without putting that structure in place, um, you know, I, I think it can be done both ways. Yes, we have another question. Uh, Caroline here from Scoutly. Uh, I have a quick question. As we say, there is more, capi there is, uh, more capital coming in Australia, but what do you think about like early stage? It seems like there's always like always more and more capital every year, but it seems like it's always go to later stage companies. What, what do you think about like early stage company? I, I, I tend to agree with you. I think, look, you know, and the, the numbers show that it has really progressed up curve, um, you know, and, and as there are more, you know, sort of large super funds and the likes investing, there's stricter covenants around what can be backed. And so, you know, I, but what that has enabled is for a new growth of early stage funds. I think, as I mentioned, there are a huge number of early stage funds coming. I know of about a dozen, um, you know, I've worked alongside a bunch of them recently that are backing pre-seed and seed. There are others like Artesian who've continued to back early. And so, you you know, I, I think there is still plenty of capital here. One of the things I think that has really changed, though, for uh, people fundraising in Australia is actually the quality of founders and the education of founders is much higher over the last few years, and so competition is also tougher. So you've got this piece where, well, while there is more funds available, there is also more competition, and so it probably hasn't gotten any easier, really, as a net-net. Yeah, I, I think... 
mean, I, I think there's plenty of capital around in the early stages, and and I, I mean, I think, you know, my advice would be would would, would do your research and, and find the funds that that are working in the early stage space. Like you can you can waste a lot of time, you know, pitching to funds that don't, don't have a lot of interest in the early stage, and they they might do something because they see something. But you, you know, go to the more I guess programmatic funds that are that are really trying to build diversified portfolios early. Um, and look, the other thing I'd say is that look, I, I I'm a big believer in in the fact that that good founders and good businesses generally always get get funded. You, you've just got to stick at it, do your research, find the right people, and um, be persistent. Thank you. Thank you very much. We unfortunately don't have time. Otherwise, the prosecco spritz will get warm. <laughs> <laughs> So um, it's time to close um, uh, the panel. So just uh, to conclude, uh, I'd like to ask our, our panelists just uh, one, last, uh, one last thing. So your, your advice for the founders for uh, 2021. <laughs> one advice? <laughs> yeah. Or three, <laughs> or one. Get in front of it. Adaptability. <laughs> Yeah. One word. <laughs> Faster. <laughs> Surround yourself with good people. <laughs> Technology. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Amanda, Melissa, Matt, Luke. Uh, thanks a lot for uh, sharing your insight and perspective for 2021. I hope you enjoy the conversation and that you are more equipped for 2021 with adaptability. And, <laughs> um, and so, yes, Leo, stage is yours. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, you know, we'll, um, we'll uh, soon conclude, but I really wanted to, uh, to thank all, uh, all our panelists, to uh, Chuan as well, you know, uh, in the making of this event. Uh, and, uh, you know, surely uh, 2020 has been a, a challenging year for all of us, but uh, as we heard, um, there has been a, a lot of positive, um, you know, out of it. Uh, let's hope 2021 is going to continue to reunite us, you know, Australia, but also the, the rest of the world. Um, and um, maybe, uh, so we'll, 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 let, we'll let you go, and we'll introduce uh, Delidor, the, the founding team of Delidor. Uh, so basically, uh, a new uh, online uh, option for you uh, to have delicacy at home. Uh, and uh, come on, Jack, on stage. And thank, thanks so much for, for partnering with us. Uh, up to you. Hi everyone, so I'm, I'm Jack, I'm a co-founder of Delidor. Um, so um, uh, thanks for the panel, very good insight. Um, so we served you today some, uh, tonight some you know, quiche and some more food, so stay. There will be more food coming and more wine as well, so, um, uh, so I hope everyone enjoys the food. So quickly, I'm Noah, between, I'm between you and the food, so I'll be very short. Uh, what is Delidor? Uh, so firstly, I'm sorry, we're not a catering company, we don't do catering. So, Tonight we did it for Leo, but we're more than that. So we are a food startup, and we, our objective is to help uh, Australian families eat well and healthy foods. And how we do this? Well, can you remember the last time you guys had you know, nothing to eat in your fridge or were too lazy to cook something or no inspiration? Well, I can tell you it was last this week. And how I met many times this happened per week, um, or per month, quite a few times, you know, really looking back. And I can tell you as a father, I feel sometimes very guilty when I have to cook some plain pasta to my three-year-old daughter. Because I've got, I've got no time, I'm like, well, she ate that. Well, that's the problem we're going after at Digidor. And how we do it? Well, we got our customers going on to Digidor.com.au, ordering some prepared meal, a set of prepared meal to cover for those nights where, you know, you don't want to cook. And from there, they order, we cook, we deliver, you receive the food, put it into your freezer, and once this night happens, or the lunch, you put the food out of your freezer, defrost, reheat, and eat, et voila. Great meal. So, and you should try, it's really good. So, if you think about Digido, we cook the, the food ourselves, we have a chef, we have a kitchen in Sydney, 
and uh, we cook using real food, real ingredients. Key thing about the food is it's frozen, and it's frozen because um, it's much better for the environment, and as well, we don't have to use nasties or preservative to get the chef life longer. So again, you have the food in your freezer, and when you have the, those of those nights, just put the food out of the freezer and eat. Um, two things we kind of big at the door. One is transparency, you know, how we cook the food and which ingredients we use to cook the food, very important today. Second point is climate change. I know everyone talks about that, but that's very critical for us. You know, how do we minimize our impact on the environment? So we're working you know, toward different projects, looking at different packaging to deliver the food, to maintain the food frozen with some sustainable packaging, working toward you know, getting our kitchen carbon neutral, and other projects we're working on. So tonight we have a special offer. If you guys want to try some good food at home, 20% uh, using the code FNA20. Hear more or learn more about us, just give us a chat. Uh, Mathieu, my co-founder, is at the back, and you can find us. Thank you. Thank you, Do. Thank you so much, Jack. And I, I must say I'm one of the early adopters, I'm one of the beta testers, and I'm still here, alive, you know, I can still run. So, you know, I would uh, warmly recommend, and, you know, it works in, uh, in Sydney, you know, maybe soon for virtual attendees, soon in Melbourne, Adelaide, but let's, um, let's try it first, and you tell me. Okay, so to conclude, like, uh, you know, very, very happy to be, uh, to be back um, to Sydney. A big thanks to all of you in the room, and obviously a big thanks to, uh, you know, various sponsors and backers, so including Brink, Artesian, uh, La French Tech Australia. Uh, we've got um, Pauline from the from the French Embassy here uh, tonight. Uh, OVH Cloud, uh, Clément and Yan Ling in Melbourne. Uh, Pledge One Percent, Mark and uh, and Kate in Hong Kong. Uh, Delidor, Fish Burners, obviously. Thanks Stream Labs. Uh, we've got uh, Thanks Stream Labs CEO here, Brad, uh, my new triathlon friend. So if you've got uh, any, any question, um, come and find us. If you want to partner with us, uh, continue to make you know, Startup and Angel a great place to, uh, to connect. Come and find uh, Axel or myself or my amazing team, Florencia, Nadia, uh, Pooja. Um, so we've got Lea as well from Brink volunteering with us tonight and uh, Sophie uh, in Mexico. Uh, online for all, all of you uh, following on YouTube. And uh, if you're still on Zittings, uh, please uh, let us know where we went. Uh, you know, the, the best part of those events is always the networking part and the drinks. We've refilled the drinks. Um, there's more Prosecco Spritz, <laughs> thanks to Tankstream Labs and Beers. Uh, so, yeah. Thanks so much for, for coming. We'll leave this survey online. Uh, you know, you can find all the QR codes to continue to vote. And uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's the fun begin. And we've got till, uh, I think, 9.30 here. So, you know, make the most of it. Uh, connect in person and, um, you know, have a, have a great end of 2020, this uh, challenging year. Um, yeah, thank you for being with us. starts with an idea. You're on to something. A truly meaningful solution for a problem facing our society. So you persevere. You push forward. Then one day, you're ready to make your pitch. This is your dream. Your chance to make an impact. Your positive change in the world. 
You talk to us. We're looking for solutions. We're inspired by your idea. We see the potential for impact. We act on it. We give advice and guidance, business and technology insights, expert mentorship, a sense of community, and a movement that's greater than all of us. We connect you with investors and partners that see the benefit beyond the spreadsheet. Suddenly, opportunities that were out of reach are now within your grasp. And because we see the world through your eyes, we're with you every step of the way, creating a real, sustainable business that connects profit with purpose, financial return with value for society. The result might just change the world. Brink. Empowering Game Changers. Today, we live in an exciting data revolution where technology is rapidly changing the way we work and live. At OVH Cloud, we are at the forefront of this digital shift as a leading global cloud provider and the number one cloud solution in Europe serving customers worldwide. We are independent and vertically integrated with our data centers across our own fiber optic network bringing businesses everywhere a secure and efficient alternative to the other cloud hyperscalers with complete respect for data protection. And just how are we different from the tech giants? Here are four key advantages. Our history is grounded in developing innovative efficiencies with a clear vision for a more sustainable future. We own the full value chain and we manage the product life cycle. With our vibrant ecosystem of partners, customers, and our common goals, we offer a complete portfolio of cloud solutions in total compliance to industry and open source standards. And as an ecosystem, we are driven by purpose, united by common product values. Together, we are change makers, building the future of technology for all